by the hand that thou likewise with him mayest rise. That as his death calcined thee to dust, his life may make thee gold and much more just rise hard thy Lord is risen thy Lord is Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to this service for Sunday the 3rd of May, the third Sunday of Easter. We shall be thinking today about Jesus' encounter with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, an important event following the resurrection on Easter Day. We hope that these virtual services go some small way towards making up for our current inability to meet together in worship during these difficult times. But as Dame Vera Lynn and Her Majesty the Queen have both said, we'll meet again. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And now David Suchet, a member of our congregation, reads from Psalm 116. Psalm 116, verses 1 to 3 and 10 to 17. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered 
distress and anguish. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. And I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. Breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as killeth death. Come, my light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast. Such a feast as man's in length, such a strength as makes his guest. Come, my joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as man. The reading for today is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 24, beginning at verses 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astonished us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, 
and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The passage from Luke which David read for us is a key passage in the story of Christ's resurrection and his appearance to his disciples. Two people, and I'll say more about their identities later, were walking the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. One of the questions that I think reasonably arises is how exactly Jesus appeared to them. I don't mean how he appeared in the sense of what he looked like, but in the sense of how it was that he was not there at one moment and was there the next. Luke is actually quite prosaic about this. Jesus came near and went with them. Now the physicality of the encounter is all important as becomes apparent later when they sit down to eat. So when Luke says that Jesus came near, from which direction did he come? They were in deep conversation, talking with each other about all these things that had happened in Luke's words. So they probably would not have noticed him even if he'd been coming towards them from the direction of Emmaus. The same is likely true if he'd come from their left or their right. But what seems most natural is that he should have been travelling in the same direction as the two, from Jerusalem towards Emmaus, and caught up with them. That's how we normally understand the idea of people drawing alongside one another on a path. So we now assume Jesus was walking along the same road from the direction of Jerusalem towards Emmaus. Why? Why was Jesus walking along that road? Did he have some business in Emmaus or beyond? If so, what was it and with whom? To put it another way, was his encounter with this pair accidental or did he intend all along to catch up with them? Was there anything particular about them which might have led Jesus to single them out for this revelation of his post-resurrection presence. Later in the service, while you're listening to the final piece of music, you'll see some depictions of the supper at Emmaus, as it's known. The fact that Jesus broke bread, that the bread was physically broken by Jesus, makes the essential point that Jesus here was not some sort of vision or mirage, a spiritual emanation or an illusion. That bread got broken. In all the pictures you'll see this more or less clearly. Perhaps the most unexpected depiction is that by the Flemish painter Cornelis Engels, in which the foreground is occupied by a young man and a woman apparently intruding on a still life painting of foodstuffs. You have to look quite carefully into the top right hand corner to see in the distance Jesus at table with two figures in the traditional Emmaus supper image. Nobody really knows why Engels chose this unusual way to show the supper at Emmaus, but we can speculate that he wanted to contrast the overabundance of rich foodstuffs in the foreground with the basic but essential food in the background, the bread of life, 
a contrast between self-indulgence and simplicity. What's common to all the pictures except the last one, the icon, is that the two disciples with Jesus are clearly both men. In the icon, one is a woman. The Greek Orthodox priest who gave the image to David, Suche, explained that the man is Cleopas, as in Luke's account, and that the woman is his wife, Mary. Bible scholars of various denominations have also suggested that Cleopas's fellow traveller was indeed his wife, Mary. They put together the identities of Mary, mother of James, referred to in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a witness of the empty tomb, and Mary, wife of Clopas, in John 19, 25, who was also present at the crucifixion. They then take Clopas in John as just a variant spelling of Cleopas in Luke. These connections are well supported by church tradition, dating as far back as the second century. This makes a lot of sense. If Cleopas's wife Mary was with him in Jerusalem for Passover, as she surely would have been, it follows that both would have been travelling together to Emmaus, for whatever private reason afterwards, and the simplest explanation would be that that was where their home was. It would seem natural for a married couple to converse with each other along the way about what they had experienced, the rabbi they'd been following who'd been crucified, and rumoured, however improbably, to have risen from the dead, and what it all might mean. In Luke's account, when they got to Emmaus, Jesus made as if to leave them, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. The most natural interpretation of stay with us is surely stay at our place, in our home. And a household at that time and place would have consisted essentially of a married couple, man and woman. There are other images which show these two disciples with Jesus as a man and a woman. Like most of the church for most of the past 2,000 years, you may normally have read the passage from Luke envisaging in your mind's eye two male disciples. You might like to read the passage again and ask yourself if Luke's account makes better sense, if the two were men or if one was a woman and the wife of the man. There is no right answer and no prizes, I'm afraid. What is certain is that the two were granted an extraordinary encounter with the risen Jesus. He broke a fundamental rule of Jewish etiquette, which required that the host should break the bread for the guest. So they would have been taken aback when he reached out and broke the bread. And it is at that very moment that their eyes were opened and they recognized the risen Jesus. No wonder that they lost no time in rushing back to Jerusalem to tell the other disciples of their experience. As Luke says, then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. You might reasonably ask why it was that Jesus had then vanished from their sight. Might it not be that having proved that he genuinely risen from the dead by the physical act of breaking bread, he furthermore proved that he was indeed God by his ability to remove himself from their sight? He had accomplished what he'd sought to accomplish with this couple. Finally, you might like to imagine what the other disciples said when they heard the story from this couple. I imagine that it will have been something like, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness to us. In this season of Easter, as we continue with Christians around the world to say, Holy, 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 Alleluia, 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 Jesus Christ is risen. We remember that story of those who recognized Christ in the story of the road to Emmaus, when Jesus broke bread, gave them wine, and then their hearts were glad within them. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life of all who put their trust in him, raise us, we pray, from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that we may seek those things which are above, where he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and for ever. Amen. We pray for your church throughout the world. And as we do so, we pray here for Her Majesty the Queen, all the members of the royal family, for Archbishops Justin and John, for Sarah, Bishop of London and Dean of the Chapels Royal. We remember the family of the Chapels Royal. And here today we remember the chapels of St. Peter and St. John, the congregations that would normally be joining with us this morning in prayer, but now are joining with me in prayers at home or wherever they are. Almighty God, direct and guide your church with your unfailing care, that it may be vigilant in times of quiet and daring in times of trouble. We ask this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we pray for our nation and the nations of the earth, we pray for all who are affected by the coronavirus, those who have today or will today contract the disease, for those already ill from it and those in hospital. We give particular thanks for the hard work and dedication of all NHS staff and those who support their work. We pray also for our government, for sound leadership and wisdom, for our medical and scientific services who will guide them, and all who are working to find a quick solution to this pandemic, both here at home and abroad. We use our prayer. God of love, we ask your blessing on those who are ill, those who are vulnerable, those who are worried about themselves and those they love, and all those who on this day mourn. We ask this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we remember those who are ill in body, mind and spirit, we also pray this morning for those who have been asked, who have asked of our prayers here in the chapel. Remembering particularly Susan, Joe, Theodore, Rustam, Rory, Isabel, Hilary, Bill, Neil, Margaret, Noel, Denise and John. Father, pour your spirit upon them. Be with them and with their families at this difficult time. We ask this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If I pray finally for our family and for our friends, those who are not around us at this time. Almighty God, who is present everywhere, look down with your mercy upon those who are absent and are not among us at this time. Give your holy angels charge over them. Grant that they may be kept safe in body, soul and spirit and presented faultless before your presence and with exceeding joy and say exceeding glory may know they're in your arms. We ask this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits us here, ever this day be at our side, to light, to guard, to rule, and to guide. Amen. So we come to our final prayer and blessing. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God, who through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ has given us the victory, give you joy and peace in your faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be with you this day, and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. <laughs>